Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our TF server. How has everyone been doing? Doing well, thank you. How about you? Glad to hear. I'm fine. Not too bad. Well, let's see how I can help with uh, your upcoming homework. I heard the due time of uh, your homework gets changed to tomorrow, so you can get more time. Yes, I did have a question. I think I figured it out, but for the last problem, um, in the videos, we were using random to get the probabilities, but I think they're given to us, so we're just supposed to plug that into where random was in the formula. Mm -hmm. the normal inversion. Okay. Yeah, it's um, okay. straightforward for the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, thank you. So yeah. I have a question regarding Hi. the Monte Carlo simulation. Hi, this is Raji. How are you? Um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, could you help me read your name again? This is Ram Raji. Ram Raji. Wow, yeah, that's a new Hi. name for me. Okay. 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 So you practiced on the last problem and yeah. what did you find? So I wanted to know, like, what is the difference between using like the random max and min versus using the norm inverse function using the mean and standard deviation? Is there a difference or why, why would you use so, so the, so, you know, I think, I think mm. it was done a couple of ways that I did it. One way I did it was using the, um, the min plus random times max minus min. Oh, oh, okay. It, or, or, or another way, the other way I ran the probability was um, the norm inverse function mm -hmm. yep. and then probability mean and standard deviation so i wanted to know what's the difference well glad that you asked um good so the difference is that uh, using the inverse normal distribution we are guaranteed that they generated random numbers for the units sold right um we'll follow a normal distribution and instead if you used the uh, the other way you described, which is to add a random number over um, uh, the minimum, <clears throat> then uh, what's generated sounds like a uniform distribution because the random number generator uh, in most computer systems automatically generates a uniform distribution between zero and one. And if mm -hmm. we do that, the resulting variable will also follow a uniform distribution. And uh, yeah, I was, uh, and there's another problem. Uh, since you mentioned you would like to add uh, a random number to the minimum. So how, where, where and how did you get the minimum? Uh, because it's not uh, a, a uniformly distributed variable does not have a minimum. Mm, okay. Yeah, so the way we use the inverse normal distribution <clears throat> is to guarantee the generated random number follows uh, what's described in the question as a uh, necessarily a normal distribution uh, over uh, with specific uh, with a specific mean value and standard deviation. Got it. Okay, thank you. Good. <clears throat> wow. It's interesting that uh, some of you really like to discover some uh, new um, realm <laughs> in <laughs> statistics. Yeah. Uh, which question was that? That uh, oh, we were discussing problem three. Uh, Ramaraji was wondering uh, but three, what, yeah, how was how, was how was it. Um, I mean, you're talking about problem three, assignment seven. Did it have problem three? 
Uh, yeah. Am I right? I. I was, right. It's problem um, two. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's problem two. Okay. Sorry, my eye. Uh, wrong reference. Yeah. But the idea is to, to generate some randomly distributed variable according to a specified uh, distribution. Yeah, that, this way, well, that's actually how uh, other, any type of distribution uh, can be generated. If you run into problems where uh, a, a normal distribution is not appropriate, but some other distribution is appropriate, we can also use such inverse probability function to generate whatever distribution you would like. Hey, Jerry, since we're on number two, um, I, I'm just having a hard time sort of understanding what, how we're supposed to set this up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I was trying to fiddle with the simulation file, but I don't think I, and whether maybe I'm just not using it right. I just don't see which tab we're supposed to be using that um, uh, that would have all of the um, the uh, variables that that's given to us in the um, in the problem. Like I couldn't. I yeah. I, I just. I guess I couldn't tell where where I was supposed to plug in random numbers. Mm -hmm. I kind of need help just to gotta get that started, or at least tell me which um, tab I'm supposed to use. I was trying to fiddle with all of them. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, would you mind share the work you already have up to now? Yeah, I, I was fiddling with all of them. I wasn't sure which tab I should be using. Um, okay, um, so- I actually just copied the table into Excel I didn't use any of the tabs from the workbook he was working off of. Um, uh -huh. And then I just wrote mean equals this, standard deviation equals this, so that in the, the two columns, I could input the formula for what it should be. Um, so I used the normal, just the normal, the norm dot inverse formula in the first column, referencing instead of random, referencing the probabilities given. And then, of course, the profit formula based off of than information they gave us in the problem, if that helped. So, yeah, I was gonna say, so I did pretty much the same thing as you, Shante. Um, and, and I wanted to add, so that the, the given information, the fixed cost, the variable cost, the revenue, that's unnecessary information, right? That's, I think that's what threw me off at first too. And then, and then I did what Shante did. And, seem to make sense, but then it makes me wonder, do I need to use this other information? Well, you needed to use it uh, um, for the, to calculate the profit, remember? Ah. Okay. So you Let me see. Variable costs. Yeah, you needed, you needed the whole thing to ca calculate the profit. Oh, I did do that. Okay. <laughs> but you did use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds excellent. It seems you found uh, and a good approach to address both parts of the problem. Um, if I may ask. Sure. Um, just, I mean, I did it to different, I mean, I, I tried to do it and, and to different ways using the formula, but however, I, I got two different answers each time I was calculating the profit. I was getting two different answers for the profit. Oh, really? Okay. So did you use I, and uh, I would like to know two which ways. would probably be the the right way? Yeah, sure. Um, how about you share your work with me so uh, we can all take a look at uh, uh, the two different ways uh, you used. Let me see if I can do that. I enabled. Uh, yeah. Screen I, share. Put, I mean, um, maybe someone could be asking, a quick, I mean, you could be going on to something else while I try to, to yeah. get to my file. Sure. So how about other students, uh, if you had any doubts or you had to pause in between, how about you share your work with me and other students? So we can start from there.
Yeah, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Richie. Um, I guess if no one's going to ask, I, I wanted to know if you could give us, give me a example. So can, can you please explain the difference between uniform, discrete, and normal distributions? I'm still like, I, I, I understand it, but I get tripped up when these terms come up. So I was wondering if you could clarify them for me. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, good question. Uh, let me try my best. Um, because to distinguish between, uh, um, you, you ask three distributions, right? Uh, in addition to uniform and normal, what's the other one you would like to uh, see? Uniform, discrete, and normal distribution. Oh, I see. D discrete. Okay. Um, I'm sharing my screen. I think the best way to distinguish between them is to see the uh, some charts made using them. So first is uh, normal distribution. So I think many of you should be very familiar with uh, uh, these charts um, and uh, uh, plots. So what you're looking at um, with this colored plot is the probability density uh, chart of a normal distribution, as it says on the y uh, axis. What's on the x axis is the value of the uh, random number. So for a normal distribution, we can fully describe the shape using two parameters. First one is the mean value, which is uh, shown as mu here. The other one is the um, uh, standard deviation shown as the sigma here. So a normal distribution has a very good and uh, uh, standard um, pro uh, property that we know for any normally distributed um, variable, uh, about 70%, um, about 68% of all the values uh, randomly generated or sur uh, surveyed or sampled would fall in between within, um, to, within one standard deviation around the mean value. And 95% uh, of the values would be around uh, within uh, two standard deviations. And nearly all would be within three standard deviations. So that's why in previous practice, we used uh, three as a um, rule of thumb to detect uh, outliers. If, in, uh, if one value uh, of one subject or um, an observation is three standard deviations uh, away from the mean value, we would, uh, uh, we would announce that this is an outlier. So this is a normal distribution. And uh, we can also um, find uh, the uniform distribution. Also, we use its uh, uniform <laughs> distribution. We also use the, um, let's find a best one. Well, this is actually pretty good. We also uh, take advantage of the probability density function. This function, just as the ones we used uh, in the, uh, let's say, the uh, statistics Excel file, we know this uh, lowercase f uh, function, that's for probability density. And the probability density is plotted on the y-axis. And uh, just like the normal curve, we have the values of the random number uh, or random variable on the x-axis. So a uniformly distributed uh, variable is easily comprehended as the probability of generating any values between the minimum and maximum would be equal. So uh, for example, in problem two, we are given uh, a, uh, how many, uh, 10? Yes, 10 random numbers. Uh, to conduct uh, the Monte Carlo simulation, right? Um, it did not clearly say what distribution it follows, but as I said, random numbers generated from any random number generator 
in the beginning would be uniformly distributed. So uh, if you use the function in Excel, I think it starts from R A D uh, R A N D. That that's the random number generator in Excel. It uh, automatically generates a um, variable um, between zero and one. So A on this chart uh, correspondingly, A equals zero and B equals one. So that's what a uniformly distributed variable would be like. Any questions so far? Here, both uniformly distributed and normally distributed are both continuous random, uh, random variables, which would be different than a discrete random number we are going to take a look uh, very soon. Uh, any questions so far? Nope. All right. So. Um, Another way to help understand the um, difference between these two is that um, if you surveyed or collected uh, some variables, uh, for example, units sold or profits generated, and you want to find whether it follows uh, a certain distribution, and particularly here, just for practice, if it, it follows a uniformly distributed or um, 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 normal uh, distributed uh, curve, then we simply plot them using the uh, histogram. Then, to, uh, then we can see whether the frequency would be shaped like a normal curve or it's like a flat uh, value of the uh, frequencies. Then we know which of these two distributions would uh, best describe the random uh, variable we have at hand. So last one, let's take a look at um, uh, this uh, at discrete uh, variable. So a discrete variable, unlike the other two, um, let's see whether there are, okay, this might be, uh, the best chart I can find now. Uh, oh, okay. Let's do this. So we just take a look at this chart here. The value of x, the random number, uh, sorry, the random variable we have at hand can only take three values, either two, four, or six. And uh, the chances or the probability of observing uh, these values are different for number two, x can take. The probability of uh, observing such a value is uh, 30% or 0.3. And uh, the probability of observing four is 40%. Uh, uh, and for uh, the last, uh, discrete value at six would be 30% again. So for a discrete random variable, we can only observe a certain uh, number of different values. So another a typical case is like a dice. Usually a, a, a dice has uh, you know, one to six marked on each side. So we can only observe uh, uh, possibly six different numbers out of, uh, uh, out of throwing a dice. So it's not like a random or uniformly distributed uh, random uh, variable, which can take any value in a certain range. A discrete variable would only take a certain, a, a limited number of uh, different variables. So this would be my description of uh, uh, the distinction between these distributions. Thank you. Any questions? No, I got it. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Well, uh, then uh, one thing I was uh, about to share is that why we used a um, uh, 
uniformly distributed random number as given in a problem to generate a normal distribution curve, right? So uh, let me see what's the, okay. Um, the reason or the benefit behind it is that uh, using this technique, we can generate any distribution uh, in the future, not just for normally distributed. Lots of the time, a random variable we get from real data collection does not necessarily follow a normal distribution. So what to do in that case? Then uh, here is what a, um, um, the Monte Carlo simulation uh, benefit us. So for, um, okay. Yeah, that, well, I guess I need to enlarge it. So earlier we took a look at the probability density curve, right? That's uh, uh, the, the, the best known uh, bell curve that we see for normal distribution. However, it also comes with a uh, cumulative density, uh, cumulative distribution function. Here it's called the normal cumulative distribution function. It's basically we take integration from the um, of, at each value of x and uh, calculate the area under this curve. As we can see, the area will become larger and larger if we move from the left uh, from the leftmost of the axis to the rightmost of axis. So that means um, the cumulative um, probability we have for a normal distribution would go uh, nearly zero to nearly one if we increase the value of the uh, random variable. So uh, using the technique we apply in problem two, what we were doing is actually first, uh, we have the uh, random number given uh, the 10 random numbers we have in the question, right? What we do is we plug in those numbers to the y-axis. You see in this y-axis, the, uh, the value ranges between zero and one. It represents the cumulative probability for a normal distribution, right? Um, given a number between zero and one, we would uh, use this chart to find the corresponding value in x. So for example, given 0.75 uh, as for example, one of the 10 random numbers we have in the, uh, in the problem, then we would move, uh, we would find a corresponding X value. So which is close to one, um, it's just a pro an, an a, a approximation I have. Given a number, for example, 0.25, then uh, correspondingly we find a value um, that's uh, between zero and negative one. However, um, if we change the distribution of the normal uh, with a different mean and a different standard deviation, the labels of the x axis would be different. For example, in problem two, we know the unit sold, right? follows a mean of 900 and standard deviation of 60. So using this information, we could possibly generate another chart with a 60 instead of zero um, plotted in the center of the uh, horizontal axis. And um, the distance between each mark here would also correspond to a value uh, that's related to the given standard deviation of 60. So using that chart, uh, we can map the uh, correspondence between a uniformly distributed uh, random number between zero and one to a normally distributed uh, variable. Uh, that'll be our unit sold. So that's the advantage of uh, using um, a Monte Carlo simulation. Any questions so far? Oh, okay.
I did have one question when reading and studying and listening to the videos. Um, the decision, right? So this whole thing is about decisions. And so we're running these simulations. And um, I don't know if maybe we're getting to it, but how then would people make their decision? Like on problem two, we ran all of these. Are we just picking one or, you know, are we saying, are we trying to decide, okay, this is good because I'm averaging this or how is then the, the ultimate decision made? Oh, okay. So it sounds like you, uh, your question is actually how, what information we can extract from uh, this uh, practice in terms of decision-making, right? Yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> excellent. Um, so in this practice, the information of a random variable we have is regarding the units sold. And uh, the results we want to infer is about the net profit. And uh, using the results of this practice, we would find the mean value of the net profit. Uh, so that's a decision related variable. So in many real cases, we want to find out whether the net profit would be larger uh, than the cost. So, uh, so if we um, want to make a decision about the expected um, profit, then that's how we can get that. Thank you. Excellent. I can also think of other use cases. So um, in some occasions, we want to make forecast of the profitability um, of a business. However, this uh, such forecast is always under some uncertainty. So in the future, we won't for sure know how many units are sold. However, based on previous um, um, survey or uh, database, we can, we can have some educated guess. It's like um, we make a uh, forecast that comes with some uncertainty. This uncertainty uh, usually is represented by the standard deviation. So uh, under a certain forecast, we want to make sure, for example, under 80% of the cases, our net profit would exceed this amount. Then uh, using the methods described um, in problem two, we can also generate such uh, results. Uh, for example, um, using the results generated, we can make another chart for the net profit. Then we can find um, correspondingly. Hello? Uh, it seems like I can't think the screen has frozen. Oh, oh, it's not. Uh, I'm not showing anything new. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, so we can also use the methods here uh, to give some uh, uncertainty measurements um, for forecasts. Great, thank you. My pleasure, Shanti. Has anyone uh, started working on problem one? And any questions with it? Yes, I, I don't have any questions. I had, a, I had a question on E. Oh, okay. That's Walter. Yes. Glad you asked. Um, did you get some results already, or you had uh, you need some help to get started? Uh, I, I did get results, but I don't know if it's right. Obviously, so okay. How about you describe the oppo uh, the approach you took? Let me see. Um, so you take the value of the sum of your um, your expected values, right? Mm -hmm after you do the formula for each alternative. And I took the 172.38 minus the best alternative, which was 
the um, which was the 110.05 for apartments after plugging in the formula. You get the uh, multiply the, the, you would multiply the probability by the actual profit or the dollar value, get that amount and add them all together to get your average right. And then you get that sum. So 110 was the highest. So I chose 110 as the best alternative. So I subtracted that by the total number don't know if that's the right way of doing it i got 6188 ah i see what did you well, say? The, uh, procedures sounds good however the um expected values you uh, used uh, did not uh, sound close to what i got so has any other students um, get some different results yeah, um, <clears throat> for my expected value from D, I had um, apartments uh, with a value of 133. Right. So I used the same approach as Walter, I think, to calculate EVPI. Um, and then my EVPI for E would then um, um, ended up being 68.5. Oh, sounds good. Um, so has uh, anyone else get a different result for part D? Um, that's the um, expected max, uh, maximum expected value. No, I got the same thing. Oh, okay. Sounds 68, good. 68. So, I think uh, I got used differently, though. Okay, uh, what I heard uh, from uh, Water was that uh, he did, uh, had a different uh, result from Part D. Um, so in Part D, the maxi, to maximize expected value, we choose the alternative with the maximum, ex uh, with the largest expected value. Mm -hmm. And in Part E, we take advantage of uh, what we already have from Part D. Um, so in, because in part D, we do not have uh, additional information regarding the certainty of the population growth trend. But in part E, we have additional information. Um, so in part E, we assume we know the uh, future, um, future uh, population growth trend. So using that, we would calculate the um, expected value under the perfect information uh, using this uh, additional information. So we would uh, take the best option under, under the declining population. And we would of course take the best option if the population goes stable. And uh, we would also uh, take the best option if the population is growing. Then we would average between these three scenarios using the given probability of uh, population growth. So that's how we can get the expected value um, with perfect information. Then we take a difference between uh, this and the result we get from part D then that'd be the expected value of perfect information because that's the difference between um, if we have the inf uh, perfect information and if we do not have such information. Hey Jerry, I have a question. Sure. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah, but... of course. So, Um, so I kind of saw it a little bit differently. So the expected value of 133, I understand, okay. um, because we're Let's just, we're just taking the probability times the, whatever value the apartment is, and yeah. then we're taking that. Yeah, um, that's the same approach as we did in previous homework assignments where we need to calculate right. the expected value, like the but, value of vultures. Yeah. 
but when we look at the perfect information, yeah, we're taking, we're assuming that we know if it's going to be declining, stable, or growing, and we calculate uh, the uh, max, right? Uh, not exactly. So uh, here, the understanding is like under um, <clears throat> declining population, we would for sure take the uh, the largest. Um, uh, we will for sure take the action that gives the largest return. So here uh, in this chart, if the population is declining, we would follow single farm, uh, si single family houses, right? Right. Yeah. So that's the approach. But but this chance of the population growth still um, is not perfect we have 30% of chance having this scenario. So that's, that needs to be taken account for. Okay. Um, yeah, I got a little confused because what, what I did was I took the, the probability of whether it be a stable declining or growing market mm -hmm. and times it by the, the value and I got expected value of this, and I just took the max of that. Uh, so you took 110? Right, so I got 66, which was out of all of these in a declining market, and I okay. got 110 out of a stable market, mm -hmm. and 48 out of a growing market. And the song- uh, Oh, okay. I hear you. I tried that too, Uichi, the first time, and I had to go back and, yeah, I, I yeah. You, you drilled down a little too far, I think. Oh, I did. Yeah, you're only supposed to pick one option from each. Yeah, the best option. one. Yeah, the not best all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. um, sounds great. It seems uh, you are about to figure out. So, um, and with the perfect information, as other students uh, described, um, so if the population is declining, we would for sure take single family houses. And if it's right. stable, we would also, uh, wait, uh, is it, is the value now changed? I, oh, no, it's the same. Um, yeah, there might be some errors on uh, line 10 and 11. Uh, so um, yeah, that, that's why we do not need to average over all options within a certain population growth again. Okay. Yeah, Yuichi, uh, for stable, it should be 80 for single family, 175 and 90, but you have 220, I think is what mm -hmm. Jerry was saying. Oh, should, wrong? Yeah, that should be 80. Yeah. I mean, you have 80 above it, but. Yeah, for 80. Why did I put that? Okay, I gotta go check my calculation. Yeah. All right, All thank right. you. I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. Yep. Well, oh, great. Uh, seems this time the uh, most of you have uh, uh, found uh, a good method for each of the problems. Uh, any questions or other questions? All right, it seems we can end our office hour um, this time earlier. Actually, Jerry. Um, okay. If, if no one has any questions, can I can I share my, I just fixed it. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so, so we're saying that for apartments, um, 
Uh, so we, if we want to maximize expected values, right, we're saying we want to pick apartments yeah. at 133, uh, which I understand. And then it says, what is the most amount of money that she would be willing to spend to get more information about the possible population trend? Mm -hmm. um, so if she wants information about the population trend, so you're saying that this calculation would be incorrect? Uh, the calculation looks fine. However, how okay. do you make decisions uh, using that? And uh, would you mind elaborating right. on that? So first of all, um, we, we, we wanna say in a declining market, we expect single family home to be 220. Mm -hmm. So the expected value is 66 because it's 0.3 times 220. And then we go down the list, the tree, and then we find the maximum expected value out of a declining market, a stable market, and a growing market. Mm -hmm. And then we add it up for a total of 201.5. Sounds excellent. And then I think, and I think I just answered my own question. We just subtract that from D, which says if a manager wants to maximize expected values, then she would have chosen the apartments. So then we end up with 68.5. Yeah, that's okay. a great approach. So here, uh, our uh, in underlying thinking is that, well, um, if the population is actually declining, um, then we would uh, uh, use this information, right, to build uh, single family homes. Then our return would be 220. If the population is stable, then we would use this purchased information and build apartments and get uh, uh, a return of 175. Then if it's growing, uh, use this information, we would build condos instead, then, uh, uh, then we will get 240, right? So uh, this part is very straightforward. Then we need to take uh, into account for the different probabilities of uh, uh, such scenarios to happen. So that's why we need to time uh, point three with the uh, with the maximum return uh, right. and uh, of uh, uh, single family homes. So that's why we uh, uh, that's why and how we can uh, average over these three scenarios. So great, yes, you actually uh, answered your own question, and uh, that's a uh, very smooth uh, procedure. Okay, got it, thank you. And also, J Jerry, I mean, for me, I just, it's, it's remembering the nodes, so the chance to use the, the EV, and then for the decision node to use the, the highest value. And then, I don't know, I just bring that up because it helped me remember. <laughs> wow, wonderful. Yeah, each of us has uh, different uh, methods of uh, uh, remembering things. Yeah. I mean, I literally graphed out just like you did, Yuichi. Um, Yuichi. Um, I graphed it out, but literally with circles and squares to just help me remember. Right. Thanks, Ramaraji. Thank you, Jerry. Understood. I got it. Perfect. Any other questions? Thank you.
Thank you, Jerry. Have a great week. I'm oh, signing off. Thanks, Jerry. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Have a great week. Thank you.